Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cafe on Tampa Online. I'm Bill Carlson here with my uh, program co-chair, Del Acosta. Del, please introduce our speaker. Well, good morning, Bill, and good morning to the Cafe on Tampa family as we meet in safe distance. Today, we have a very topical program, political communication in turbulent times. Uh, our speaker is Dr. Joshua Sacco, Dr. Joshua Sacco, Assistant Professor of Communications at USF and faculty researcher with the USF Nelson uh, Nielsen uh, Sunshine State Survey. Uh, Dr. Shako, please tell us a little bit about the USF Nielsen uh, Sunshine State Survey uh, and a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks so much, Bill and Dell, for having me this morning. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Joshua Skako. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Communication, uh, where I focus on political communication. And uh, some of what I'm gonna be chatting with you all about this morning uh, is related to our April survey of 600 Floridians uh, with the USF Nielsen Sunshine State Survey. The survey is a statewide, uh, statewide assessment um, in this particular instance of attitudes uh, and opinions related to the coronavirus pandemic. So we asked individuals specifically about government performance, about government policies of mitigation uh, for the coronavirus. So, what, so some of what I'll be sharing this morning will be specifically related to that, as well as some insights related to thinking about um, political communication in general from uh, our political leaders uh, during this particular time. Great, and uh, for, any, for everybody who's watching, uh, please, uh, we do this so that we can share information broadly with the public and we offer this service for free. So please hit the share button and share it on your feed with your friends and family. And also Cafe on Tampa style, if you're watching this live eight o'clock on Friday morning, uh, you can post a question either underneath the feed if you're watching on your phone or to the right if you're watching on your PC. Um, Josh, tell us about the some of the initial findings of the survey, if you could, please. Yeah, absolutely. So what we found uh, in general was that there was widespread concern um, uh, among Floridians related to the coronavirus. A majority of individuals uh, were concerned that they would be personally uh, affected or infected by the virus in the next three months. Uh, they were also three quarters of our survey respondents were concerned that someone they know would be affected as well. And so thinking in some ways about uh, what this meant for things like uh, attending to the news more, which is what we saw in the survey. Individuals were reporting that they were uh, watching the news or reading the news more. Uh, two thirds of our uh, survey respondents were uh, either getting a lot or some information from President Trump's daily press briefings in April. Uh, about 60% of Floridians that we surveyed were getting a lot or some information from Governor DeSantis's uh, press briefings about the coronavirus. So this was uh, really uh, an important environment where concern was leading to uh, information searching and seeking behaviors. And that's really important for thinking about how political leaders communicate about the public health crisis and uh, as well as where we're at currently with thinking about issues like a mandated mask requirement that both uh, Tampa and St. Petersburg are considering at the particular moment and what that will mean going forward. Josh, um, there's been a number of surveys and a lot of information thrown out there. As a consumer, how can we tell correct information from what is sometimes known as fake news? So this is probably the most important question and also the most prominent question I get from my students, which is, where to look for uh, particular uh, accurate information, reliable information. And uh, there are a couple of things that I tell my students. The first is that uh, no one information source will give you the complete picture of what's going on. Um, so what I usually do is describe how I get my inf information and I tell my students that I look at one newspaper, I look at one uh, television news source and then one online news source and then do some cross-checking on my own. But beyond that, there are, other, there are other strategies as well. So from as simply as looking at the URL, uh, the hyperlinked of a news site to make sure that there is, um, if it's a government website, that's a .gov website. If it's a news website, there's no weird link that takes you to some other type of website. 
uh, you want to make sure that the information is current uh, so that if it is covering information, for example, on the coronavirus in February, uh, it will look very different than what we know now uh, in uh, June related to the coronavirus. So making sure it's current. And then finally, making sure that if it's a news article that there is a reputable journalist or reporter who is writing the story or uh, behind the story, and that can be done with a simple Google search. So the key thing is it takes a little bit of extra work to make sure that the information you're looking at is accurate, but it's also worth it in making sure that you're not necessarily falling victim to um, something that is uh, intentional false information that we see online, particularly related to the coronavirus. So intentionally putting out false information is disinformation and then unintentionally unintentional false information would be misinformation. Let me hit on a on a on a um, sensitive topic or important topic at this point. We know that because of the Facebook algorithms that people have been watching more and more news uh, tailored to what their interests are. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're in art, you'll read a lot of art stuff. If you're uh, uh, Democrat, you'll see mostly Democratic information. If you're a Republican, you'll see mostly Republican information. So as that's happened, um, we're we're all in these bubbles unless we somehow break out of it. Um, but if you look at the two crises we're in right now, so the COVID-19 pandemic and then also the protests, um, it seems that people are also getting their information along partisan lines or within those bubbles. Um, how do we get to a point do you think in the in the future uh, where where there will be some common ground? You know, it used to be that everybody watched the same news, and so we all had the same starting point. Now we have different starting points. How do we how do we find a middle ground in communicating? Yeah, so I think the first thing on an individual level is recognition of our own biases in terms of how we look for information, in terms of the sources that we attend to. So one of the things we want to think about is. Um, is this source of information, the kind of the question that I ask myself or that I tell my students to think about is, is this source of information comforting to me because it's only, it's only encouraging me to think the same that I, that I already think? Or is it challenging my set of beliefs? Um, those I think are particularly important for assessing in these individual situations what's happening. So I'll give you an idea of Bill and Dell, some of the things that we found in terms of the survey, in terms of the Sunshine State Survey. So we found, for example, that uh, Republicans, uh, uh, Republican Floridians were more likely than Democrats and independents to be watching the president's daily press conferences in April. So this is unsurprising. Republicans were tuning in to uh, a like-minded political figure talking about the coronavirus uh, in April. But what we also find is that when we look at, for example, support for policies, uh, in our April survey, we find that 80% of Floridians were supportive of a face mask requirement, uh, for a statewide face mask requirement to wear face masks in public places. The key thing to keep in mind here, though, is that when you look at some of the partisan differences, we were beginning to see partisan splits on that issue. So 80% is actually um, an interesting data point because according to the most recent research, uh, to get uh, to the level where you can no longer transmit or reduce transmission of the virus publicly, you need 80% compliance from the public. Uh, you, so you need 80% of a public to be wearing face masks. So this is why it, in a, particularly in a public health situation, but also as we're seeing with the protests, as we're seeing um, with nationwide conversations over race and policing, that uh, in a public health situation, uh, you need widespread compliance. And in our media environment, where, as you said, Bill, people can be in their own echo chambers of political information, that gets much, much harder. You mentioned the newspaper is a, sort, a reliable source of information. What do you see the source of the printed media and the online media and the newspaper in general and local news uh, being conveyed to the newspaper, the local newspaper? Yeah, so um, one of the big things that I tell my students, particularly with a good bit of local information, but also some national news information, is much of the information that they might be reading on a particular story has already been sourced from what's called a wire service, so the Associated Press or Reuters. Um, and so what I often tell my students, particularly with newspaper sources and local newspaper sources um, or local online sources, 
is go to the original source. Um, and so what a wire service, an Associated Press or Reuters service will give you is they will give you the who, what, where, when um, of a news event. And so that will give you the initial base of what's going on in the world. And then moving from there to other particular sources becomes really important uh, in terms of if you want a little bit of uh, the why behind it or interpretive kind of styles of journalism, uh, you know, the cable news uh, will, cable news will give you that as well. Um, there are downsides to that, obviously, which um, we see in this particular environment that um, some cable news outlets can be more reliable than others. But uh, at least when we're thinking about print news coverage and online news coverage, uh, quite a bit of information is already being sourced from journalists who are doing the work at wire services like at the Associated Press or Reuters. So one thing we see in this news is that um, some of the traditional sources of media, like the local TV stations, radio stations, um, the Tampa Bay Times, are getting really aggressive online, making sure that they're inside those bubbles, that they're penetrating those bubbles so that people see the news. And then we also, in the last 10 years or so, have seen the rise of the blogs. And we see ones like, uh, you know, Florida Politics, as Peter says, he was sitting in his underwear in his bedroom typing, and now suddenly he's got like 30 reporters around the state. And so sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between um, uh, news organizations that follow standard news practices versus, versus somebody new who's starting out uh, blogging their opinion. Um, how, how do you uh, advise your students to look through that? Yeah, so um, what I tell my students is, um, this is where a little bit of research on the person doing the reporting is important, um, as well as identification of the person. So. Um, Oftentimes, if we think about what is either disinformation or misinformation that we will come across, one of the key, uh, one of the key items to think about is uh, the stories that you might see that might be considered disinformation or misinformation. Don't identify who is writing it. Don't, don't identify the author of the information. Or the author of the information might be um, projecting themselves to be an expert in a particular area of study. But if you do a quick Google search, you might see that they have not even studied or practiced in the area that they've done. We've seen that some with the coronavirus situation that individuals who might not be epidemiological experts have been putting out information on the spread of these of these of the virus and those types of uh, and those types of public health issues. So a quick Google search is oftentimes the best way in which you can uncover whether or not the person, who might be a blog author, um, whether or not they are a recognized authority on those particular issues. So I tell my students that I will, you know, oftentimes what happens is news media sources identify someone as an expert uh, source um, and uh, news sources go through uh, particular types of vetting techniques uh, to make sure that they're getting accurate information from the sources that they're talking to. Let me ask you um, uh, first an ad for Cafe on Tampa. If you're watching uh, live, this is eight o'clock on Friday morning, uh, please ask a question underneath the feed if you're on your phone or to the right if you're watching on your computer. And uh, please, we do this as a service to the community to share information as broadly as possible. So please hit the share button and share it with your friends and family. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit subscribe. Um, I want to ask you, so you're, this topic is about political communication. There's um, a lot of local races going on right now. Uh, national races. So if you're, a, if you are a local uh, Tampa, St. Pete, Hillsborough, Pinellas um, uh, politician running for office right now, um, what would you, wh what pram what things should you consider in this particular environment? So um, I'm not in the advice business anymore. I used to be a former academic uh, in, uh, in a former life before I was an academic. Uh, so, um, but I think one of the things that um, is critically important for all, uh, for really all candidates and, and really elected elected officials and government officials to consider is the ways in which um, they're putting out messages, the ways in which they're reaching uh, diverse audiences in this environment. So what we've seen locally here in the Tampa Bay area, but also what many other local governments are doing at this time is uh, they're doing things like uh, emergency text alerts. They're doing things like uh, calling individuals to make sure that uh, they're getting potentially life-saving information related to the coronavirus. So being able to 
uh, reach audiences in the places where they are. So a local candidate, for example, might not necessarily want to try to reach or reach their target audience on a Twitter, uh, uh, on like a Twitter feed, for example, but maybe something like Facebook would be important. So in this particular environment, it's finding the audiences where they are because uh, people are so scattered in their information sources and where they look for information. And then also, I think the second thing is making sure that messages are aligned, particularly in public health messaging. It's aligned with what recognized experts are saying about the situation in terms of the recommendations uh, uh, for individuals to make about wearing face masks, maintaining social distancing, those particular types of measures. We're seeing right now in Florida that one of the challenges were that one of the challenges over time is essentially uh, you know concern fatigue that the initial concern about the coronavirus has kind of worn off and what we're seeing is that public uh, that public health officials as well as government government officials are having to step in now to mandate particular uh, particular public health behaviors like wearing masks to help compensate for the initial concern wearing off. The virus is still out there. We're seeing that in terms of the numbers uh, that, are, um, that are coming in um, and uh, particularly in the Tampa Bay area. So we're seeing rises in numbers and I think it's really important that messages from political candidates as well as government officials are being aligned with what uh, public health experts are saying about the situation. And one of the weird things. That's my question, because uh, you mentioned the need for wearing masks, social distancing, uh, washing hands. I mean, that has been pretty consistent throughout this entire period mm -hmm. of time. But how is the, and still when I go out, I see people not wearing masks, not observing social distancing. Yeah. And I don't know about washing hands. Where is the disjunct between what we need to do to get over this and accelerate it and the political communication that's occurring? Yeah, really great question, Dell. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to I'm going to share my screen with you because I have a few images to kind of illustrate some of these particular points about the importance of what's going on here um, in terms of thinking about the messages that are uh, being put out by our political leaders and specifically thinking about that um, the consistency of messages from uh, political leaders in multiple parties are really important. So. Um, this, for example, uh, the front image here was uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York during one of his press conferences give, getting a coronavirus test um, to encourage individuals in New York to get tested for the virus. Um, so these types of modeling behaviors are particularly important in terms of making sure that uh, the public understands what is at stake and the public understands the actions that they can take to be able to potentially mitigate a, pub, uh, a public health crisis. So you see, for example, um, you know, you have political leaders engage in activities like running um, to illustrate healthy behaviors uh, that individuals can do. So, you know, presidents of both parties, political leaders of both parties do this. But in a public health crisis, you also see particular examples of leaders modeling uh, these the certain behaviors. So. For example, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, during the HIV AIDS kind of epidemic, the height of it, um, First Lady Barbara Bush, uh, she visits um, she visits a um, um, essentially a location that is treating and caring for HIV AIDS patients, and she holds a baby that um, is infected with HIV. And what this does is it communicates a particular message about really combating misinformation about uh, the casual contact um, and, and whether or not that can uh, spread the virus at that time. And so there's rampant misinformation at that time that casual contact can spread it. And we know that that is not necessarily the case with HIV AIDS. So Barbara Bush holds a baby to illustrate that casual contact and human contact is important uh, for individuals. I mean, we see that in 2009, Barack Obama, for example, gets a flu shot uh, during concern about H1N1 in terms of the um, in terms of concern about uh, the uh, global epidemic at that time uh, related to that. So he gets a flu shot um, to encourage individuals and to tell them that getting a flu shot is uh, safe. Um, in 2015, Barack Obama, for example, hugs um, a patient who had recovered from Ebola. So we're hearing a lot in this epidemic about um, and pandemic about the 
concern about what has the government done in the past. And so these are two instances where government leaders have engaged in particular actions um, to model particular types of behavior that either things are okay or things will be okay. We see Governor DeSantis wearing a mask at particular moments um, and modeling this particular type of behavior. We also see our local mayors, uh, Pastor and Christman doing this and being very deliberate about the ways in which they're messaging this. So Mayor Christman even on, um, uh, on social media has been adopting kind of the phrase a mask up to encourage individuals to remind them to wear a mask in public. One of the challenges though, is that we oftentimes get, for example, the message from the White House from the president has been inconsistent on masks. So this is actually the one instance where we've seen the president wear a mask when he was uh, touring a, a, Ford, a Ford plant. But in general, most of the images that we see of the president currently when, when he is meeting with individuals or talking with individuals about the coronavirus are these ones uh, where he might either be surrounded by public health professionals who are wearing a mask or he's surrounded by individuals who are not wearing a mask. So in these particular instances, it's really important to understand that while this isn't um, while this isn't necessarily a cure-all for some of these challenges that we face, it is important for government leaders to model the behaviors that they want individuals to engage in publicly. Um, don't forget everybody who's watching live, uh, please share this if you haven't already so your friends and family can see. And then also if you have any uh, questions, uh, please post underneath or to the right. Oh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, tell me if this, this isn't what you want to talk about today, but considering the, the current environment also with the protests, um, there's a lot of sensitivity to words and language, and there's a lot of learning going on. Um, uh, politicians have mentioned words that they had used forever that they didn't know how to double or triple meaning. Um, the, uh, there are businesses that uh, where, where people innocently, uh, I think innocently posted all lives matter, not knowing the implications of that. Um, how do people uh, how do people find out about the double and triple meanings of words and 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 or how would people check to make sure they're not saying something they shouldn't be saying? So this is in some ways um, where the task of listening to each other is really important and being uh, being reflexive in our thinking is particularly important. So understanding that. Um, if we are, uh, if we're confronted about something we say, our first probably reaction is reactance to, uh, in terms of face threat that we might find that threatening in some type of way. But uh, one of the things that we know is that um, we all have implicit biases um, in terms of the ways in which we orient ourselves to the world. So understanding that and understanding that uh, we will make mistakes in terms of our communication, but that um, having an open mind um, and really open ears to understand uh, the, particularly the, uh, what we're seeing is the really um, challenging historical legacies of some of the language and words that we use and, and the etymologies of where they've come from. So the University of Florida is looking at this right now um, with some of its uh, some of its sports cheers uh, and some and and its school cheers. I know the University of Texas at Austin is looking at this. I'm a graduate. Uh, I got my PhD at UT Austin. Um, they're looking at this with um, the Eyes of Texas um, uh, song. Um, it really is a matter of understanding that um, oftentimes the argument. Uh, against change is that we've always done it this way. It's tradition, you know? Um, one of the things I talk about in my classroom is an argument from tradition is an argumentative fallacy. It's uh, it just because something has been done doesn't mean it's the right way to be done. And oftentimes what we know in the United States is that many of our traditions and legacies do have the imprints of uh, bigotry and oppression behind them and we don't even realize it. So I think understanding as opposed to initial reactance um, will go a long way to potentially correcting these things. And I think the key thing is particularly for businesses and uh, um, um, elected officials or political officials is being okay admitting that you didn't know 
uh, and that uh, a person is open to learning and understanding. And that I think is very important uh, for how uh, many individuals who just don't, who just haven't seen something uh, can open up their eyes to potentially see it. Well, do you have a final question? We're almost out of time already. <laughs> Time's gone fast. Uh, how do you think we can come together? I mean, these are turbulent times. Uh, not only are we dealing with a, a virus that is really uh, needs to be cured by the scientists, but then we have uh, uh, human rights issues that are being discussed. Uh, and these are all affect all of our lives. Uh, what kind of what are one, two, and three simple steps that we can come back together again? The first, the first that I always go to is when we think about what, um, when we think about the arguments or kind of the dis the disagreements that uh, really divide individuals. Um, I often go to uh, the way that really. Um, we can understand one another is think about what common what common places we have. So we might we might be arguing particular different points of view, but um, there might be a common place that divide that unites individuals uh, in terms of wanting communities to be better, wanting greater understanding, those particular types of things. So finding that understanding and starting from there and seeing and tracing back arguments to, un to see where disagreement is, um, is important. So in a democracy, the ways in which we talk and deliberate, we will have disagreement. But how do you move past it to at least try to get something done, to at least try to make some particular progress is very important. So starting with those common places is really important. The second thing is uh, we have to talk with people who disagree with us. And we have to talk with people who um, will potentially make us uncomfortable. And that doesn't necessarily mean acceptance or even tolerance or particular views, but it is important to, at least from our own perspective, understand where others are coming from. That might then influence our behavior and our ways of communication. Um, we might decide that, um, we might decide that you know some individuals hold particular views that are outside the norms of you know particular civil society that that is important, but in general, with what we're talking about with you know policy arguments or you know political types of arguments, um, it's important that we engage other people who disagree, um, and we engage them in a way that is pointed but is also recognizes our shared our shared humanity. So I think those are two key points. How do we, I'll hit you with my final question. How do we, how do we build a community consensus? So for all listening within our own bubble, we're communicating with our own bubbles. How do we connect the bubbles so that we, uh, we, we share on a broader scale, not just the one-on-one, -on -one, but how do we bring groups or people together to build consensus around an issue? One of the things we know from the academic research, especially on networks, is that it is actually the people in our networks that we might only have a, uh, that we might only have uh, passing uh, interactions with. So what kind of network researchers call our, our weak ties. Um, these might be our work colleagues or individuals we might see on you know, a fairly irregular basis, but these are the individuals that are actually the ones who expose us to different information, new information, new perspectives. So the people in our immediate circle, our friends, our family, the people we talk to on a regular basis in general agree with us. This is partly the reason why uh, uh, when you might talk with a family member or a close friend and they say, well, everyone I talk to thinks, thinks this way or thinks about this. We are gravitated to people who think like us. So that's why it's important in our networks to seek out the people who maybe we might only have a chancing interaction with. Those are the individuals who will potentially expose us to different perspectives and link us to different understandings and networks. That information might make us uncomfortable. And that's the key thing, which is how do we encourage individuals to, to bring in a little bit of discomfort in terms of how they see the world? That I think is an important uh, task for what I try to seek in the classroom for students, what we should try to be advocating for in terms of understanding and flexibility of different types of information that are out there. Well, that's what we try to do with Cafe Contempo. 
and mm -hmm. bring into similar ideas and have meaningful discussion and respectful discussion. And often we try to bring in uh, people of different ideas mm -hmm. and make sure that the audience is respectful of their opinion. And hopefully, uh, isn't that our mission, Bill? Yeah, and someone just posted that uh, you know travel when we're allowed to do it again is a great way to learn about other people's perspectives yep. and share ideas too. Um, our president PJ Somerville is listening. I want to thank her and the other board members. Uh, Dell and I are just two of the board members, and we're standing in during this online time. Uh, uh, Barbara Deacon is another board member. Sandy Reeve. We want to thank them, and thank uh, thanks to all of our uh, viewers and listeners. We hope to be back in person again soon. We'll continue some kind of online programming, but we'll uh, we'll hopefully get back in person soon. And thank you so much to uh, Josh here for uh, communicating with us. And, uh, and when you have another research thing, let us know. And we'll uh, invite you back. Uh, thanks. Well, thanks, so, thanks so much, Bill and Dell. Appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, do thank you, you want to tell us your website or anything, Josh? Sure. So uh, if anyone would like more information about the Sunshine State Survey, uh, you can find it at sunshinestatesurvey.org. We have our results up there from um, our latest uh, coronavirus survey. Uh, so go and check that out. Um, you can also follow up with me by email um, at jscacco at usf.edu. I'll be happy to answer any questions that maybe you had for today that we couldn't necessarily get to. So thanks so much, everyone out there for, li for listening and viewing today. Great. Thanks, everybody. Watch our Facebook events for our upcoming events and look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Thanks.